First speaker of the morning is Dr. Ian Mitchell. Um, Dr. Mitchell is an associate professor of emergency medicine at UBC, and he works in Kamloops at Royal Inland Hospital. Uh, he became interested in cannabis as a treatment for chronic pain, and he has become both a provider and a researcher. And I think that this, he's going to talk to us about Canapocalypse 2019. So, Dr. Mitchell. Well, thanks so much for having me here today, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that so many people are still here. And shout out to all of you for uh, staying until the, the bitter end. Um, so my name is Ian Mitchell, and I'm, as you see, I'm here to talk about what's going on in cannabis, and uh, hopefully a little bit of uh, things that also apply to emergency medicine. Um, just to start off with some disclosures, I've been involved uh, with this industry for about seven years, uh, so I do have some uh, speaking fees from Tilray and Maricanne. I've done some consulting for Shoppers Drug Mart and for MD Briefcase, and I'm a clinician up in Kamloops uh, with a, a cannabis clinic. Um, as far as mitigation of bias, I'm only going to refer to generic drug names during the talk. Uh, I'm not going to mention any licensed producers, and I have no insider trading information or stock tips for you. Uh, I'm someone who's lost money on Vancouver real estate, so I wouldn't come to me for stock tips. So objectives from the committee for this talk were to review the social and medical impact of cannabis legalization, how that's affected all of us. Uh, and one of their particular things was discuss evidence regarding the diagnosis and testing of cannabis-induced impairment. I've been doing a lot of talking about that with workplace, but I'm really going to be dealing mostly with uh, driving in, in this instance. So for my kind of interpretation of this talk, what I'm going to be talking about is an update on road safety. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the health impact of cannabis across the country a little bit of an update on cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. Um, when I started off this talk, vaping-related illness was kind of just a, a not really big thing, and now it's turned into kind of the thing at the moment. So I was kind of checking the CDC sites yesterday and kind of adding to the talk last night uh, still to, to come. So very uh, topical thing. I'm going to finish off with some myth-busting, just trying to correct some misinformation that's out there. And there's a lot of it, and I, I know that there's so much uh, misinformation about CBD and all kinds of things out there, so I want to try to correct a little bit of the information that's out there. Um, just a side note, the, the, in the background there, you see the BC Cannabis Store. That's actually the first uh, cannabis store that was opened in British Columbia. Um, it's just up the street from where I live, conveniently enough. Um, and I actually got to go to the uh, grand opening as a representative of the Parent Teacher Association. Uh, so it's just kind of interesting to see all the ministers there giving a good sniff to the product. Um, so, a little bit more about myself. I'm an emergency physician at Royal Inland Hospital. I'm a site scholar for the Camelot's Family Medicine Residency Program, so I teach them evidence-based medicine and research methods, and I'm an associate professor of emergency medicine with UBC. Uh, that's the view from our, my backyard. Come to BC, it's, or come to Camelot, it's a great place to work. No problem. Mm. So a year ago, we were kind of in this position of what's going to happen October 17th when legalization. And I think there were a number of people out there who figured that Canada would just be disappearing under a dense cloud of cannabis smoke from which nothing could be seen. Underneath, you'd find carnage on the roadways, Nazis riding dinosaurs, all kinds of craziness. But really what's happened has been kind of meh. Initially, there were big supply problems. There wasn't enough cannabis to supply Canadians. Um, medical patients overall have been kind of left out of the, the alert, out of the loop. Uh, they've been heavily taxed, and uh, their prices have gone up significantly with some supply restrictions. Um, we're now seeing kind of some First Nations issues, because First Nations were left out of the legislation completely. Who could have imagined that could lead to any problems? But let's just move on to the stuff that's hopefully a little bit more uh, relatable to you. And the first thing I wanted to talk about was road safety. And certainly there were many people using cannabis prior to legalization, and we haven't really seen a lot of change post-legalization. Now, police departments across the country were demanding millions of dollars in increased funding to deal with the enforcement, to deal with the impending can-apocalypse. But into, well into legalization, we see cannabis impairment arrests across the country. BC, zero. Alberta, eight. Quebec, 32. Ontario, 100 for nine months of legalization. So a little bit difficult to justify that money, but also 
not a super, you know, if you're using this as a proxy for what the, the, a problem, that, that doesn't seem to be a big issue so far. But there's a lot of issues around this, uh, this particular problem. Um, and the first one is with this device here. And this is the Draeger 5000. And this is the device that's been adopted by the Canadian government as a bre roadside breathalyzer test, point of care um, breathalyzer. There's some issues around this. It's uh, sensitivity, specificity, accuracy in the lab don't really meet the requirements necessary for a test such as this for a proper breathalyzer. This device doesn't tend to work well in the cold, which is kind of a problem if you're using it on the roadside in Canada for a good chunk of the year. But the biggest problem with this device is it doesn't really do what we want it to do. It doesn't tell us about impairment. What we know with alcohol is there's a very clear linear relationship between the amount of alcohol in your blood and your impairment, and that is just not the case with cannabis. So the Canadian government, against kind of scientific evidence, and they had scientific experts weigh in on this and say, well, this is not based on science, but nonetheless, they decide to make certain levels of THC in your blood criminal if you're driving. So if you have a THC level of over two nanograms per milliliter, you will be fined. If you have a THC level of greater than five nanogram per milliliter, you can be fined or you can go to jail. Now this is a problem because that doesn't necessarily lead to impairment. And one of the kind of test cases that's gonna come out of this uh, comes from Nova Scotia where a woman who has MS and takes cannabis as therapy for her spasms was stopped while she was driving. And she blew into one of these devices and she blew over two. Her car was impounded, she was charged, uh, she was fined. But in this process, she was taken to the police department where she underwent a DRE, which in police terms is different than what we mean it. Uh, drug recognition expert examination. Maybe she had that one too, I don't know what the police are doing there. Um, but they, the police, using their gold standard of impairment, were not able to show any degree of impairment. They would have set this woman free. So she is being criminalized by an unscientific law, and this will eventually fall. And part of the reason it's gonna fall is this study, which just came out this year, very relevant to all of us. And many of us, I think, in this room likely participate in this study. I know our site did, uh, just as a bit of disclosure. Turns out the data from our site wasn't used much in this study because uh, we have long transport times for trauma, and the blood work for this study which is designed to look at the effect of THC levels on the culpability of being in an accident, whether you caused it, not just whether you were actually in an accident. Um, but you had to take the blood within an hour, and a lot of our transit time is too long. So most of the data comes from the lower mainland. So if we start up at the top, um, if you look uh, THC under two, no problem there. But the first level of criminalization in Canada, if you have between two and five nanograms per milliliter, there's no significant impairment there. When we go down to over five nanograms per milliliter, which, for which you can be thrown in jail in Canada, there's no significant impairment. Now, there were very few patients in this study who actually had that level. So it's a small number, and so wide confidence intervals. Certainly there's a trend towards impairment. But using this study, you couldn't say that a level over five nanograms per milliliter leads to significant impairment. Even if it does, the degree of impairment is likely low because you see that the next low level down, what we have is levels of alcohol that are federally legal. You can drive under the federal system with an alcohol level of 0.07, and that's totally fine. But you will be far more impaired than if you have any amount of THC in your blood. So that's going to be a problem, and I can see this law falling very quickly. Hospitalizations, probably too soon to tell if we've had a real big increase in hospitalizations so far. Um, there's one article that said really they haven't, and, and the number of hospitals really not reported any difference since legalization. Can't say that there haven't been any health consequences. Uh, this is a case uh, in the literature, it's included in the uh, uh, references, and it should actually, I'm sorry, I should say an end STEMI. So this is a case of a 70-year-old man in the Maritimes, uh, his chronic pain, um, he has a cardiac history set of cabbage times four and has significant cardiac illness. So, but he wanted to try cannabis for his chronic pain, so he went out to a store and bought a lollipop. Now, for someone 
in that condition, if I was seeing in my cannabis clinic, I would say that a starting dose of THC for them would be one to two milligrams. That they might need a little bit more, but that would be a reasonable starting dose. So this gentleman consumed 70 milligrams of THC, more than 30 times what I'd recommend. Within half an hour, he began to have hallucinations, he believed he was going to die, and he had crushing chest pain. I went to the emergency department. So certainly, bad things can happen if you take a massive overdose of THC, and I don't think anybody's gonna say that's not the case. What, what's happening in the future, what's happening come December, is that we will bring in legalized edibles. In Colorado, there was a big problem when they introduced edibles. Big packages, big amounts, 100 milligrams of THC in a chocolate bar. It might be said, well, 10 servings, but still one chocolate bar. So people just scarf the whole thing down. In Canada, our limit is gonna be 10 milligrams per serving size, so that's gonna be the max. And that could still get people into a bit of trouble, but it shouldn't get people into the hallucinating, feeling you're gonna die, causing a heart attack kind of trouble. That's the kind of trouble that only comes from unregulated products. Cannabis hyperemesis, still a bit of a plague on everybody's emergency department. Um, there were some people that said this would increase a lot with the legalization of cannabis that never made much sense to me. If we think about the standard people who are having cannabis hyper hyperemesis syndrome, Young people smoking several grams a day. These people are not going to the government store and spending 12 bucks a gram on cannabis. They're just not. They're going to friends. It's all illicit cannabis. And that does bring up the point is, well, is this actually cannabis being the problem or is there some kind of contaminant? And there was some talk this year about whether neem oil, a pesticide used in India, and also by illicit cannabis growers might be responsible for this. Doesn't seem like it's the case. Seems very much that CHS is linked to a receptor disturbance in the t t transient receptor potential vanilloid receptors. Vanilloid receptors are found all through the body. They're concentrated in the abdomen. Interesting receptors. They're sensitive to capsaicin cream, and they are sensitive to hot temperatures. They'll open up if you expose them to temperatures about 40 degrees, like in a hot shower. So there's probably some dysfunction in these receptors. That's at the bottom of this. Um, treatment is essentially the same this year, still Haldol for emesis, uh, still capsaicin ointment on the belly. Um, but there was one uh, interesting uh, study for an emerging role of aprepitant. When I say emerging role, the study was an N of one, so I'm not sure what you can take away from that. They gave it to a patient and it worked. Aprepitant is a chemotherapy drug. Kind of looked at, I mean, it's kind of what Andanstron was 20 years ago, like, wow, crazy good stuff kind of thing. Um, it costs about $140 for a three-day course. So it is available at your pharmacies, and you know, if that means avoiding an admission, that might be something that someone could pony up for, but certainly very expensive and not something that's likely to be carried on your hospital formulary. Vaping and vaping-related respiratory illness. Um, as I said, this uh, was a little thing a while ago, but as uh, rapidly become much of a, a much bigger thing. Right now in America, there have been 13 deaths and more than 800 people sickened from vaping products. And we're still working on what the cause is. Got a couple of vape pens here. I was gonna hand them around, but I don't think that's a good idea. Um, I'll maybe just hang on to these. But these are really the problem. And I bought these in Canada, so they're not regulated. Um, they're still around. Um, kind of an interesting thing about, uh, you know, we talk, I've been talking about regulation, and I, Whistler's kind of a failure of regulation in a way. Uh, Whistler's decided they will not have uh, any legal cannabis shops, which is great, and that's kind of their right and their resort municipality they want to maintain a clean image. But people still want cannabis here. So if we talk about, you know, regulatory failure, there's no legal cannabis stores here. But if you walk out this conference center, you go 100 meters above Buffalo Bills, there's an illegal dispensary. So somehow we've got to do better than this. And they sell these. I wouldn't advise it. But here's really the answer to what's going on with this vaping stuff. And it's got to do with these uh, cartridges there. And I can open this up, but it's a pain in the butt to open this up. I bought this drugstore yesterday. So a little toxicology quiz. Can anybody tell me why it's a pain in the butt to open this up? What toxin was involved? 1982. 
But what was the toxin? Cyanide. So cyanide, before 1982, blows your mind. You could walk into a drugstore, well, I want to buy some Tylenol. Well, I can just open it up, have a look at all the capsules inside, put it back in the shelf. That was a thing. We didn't have tamper-resistant packaging until 1982 when seven people died uh, because someone went into some stores, bought some Tylenol, opened up the capsules, and put cyanide in them. And this is before the internet. Uh, there were new, the news was crazy. This was the year I graduated, and I remember it very vividly. Uh, police cars would drive through the streets warning people not to take Tylenol. So, so I open up the lid, and now I still got another layer. So, oh boy, tough to get these things out. So, this is not really a problem with cannabis. This is not really a problem with THC. This is a problem of contamination. This is a problem with lack of regulation. So we'll start off with these carts, the cartridges that you see on the top of that thing. So you can buy legal regulated cartridges in California. They're tested for pesticides, they're tested for heavy metals, uh, they're tested for other impurities. If you buy an unregulated cart, here's what happens. First of all, they get those cartridges from China. There's a city in China, and two years ago, they were making fidget spinners like nobody's business. What are they doing now? They're making vape cartridges, because that's the new thing. They retooled all their factories, and they're making vape cartridges. So they make these nice, shiny glass and metal things. Comes out, it's all covered with solvents. You got, I mean, you're never going to sell that. So you've got to make them nice and clean. So you give them a good wash with diesel fuel to get rid of all the solvents. Add kind of a healthy level of lead contamination. And then you ship all those cartridges over to America. Someone buys them, and then they fill them with their own THC oil. Now, are they using the best quality THC oil money can buy that's been tested and regulated? No, of course not. They're using the stuff that they can get cheapest off the black market, which is a very high percentage of mycobutanil contamination. Uh, mycobutanil is a fungicide. It's not terrible to eat, uh, but if you heat it up, if you smoke it, it generates cyanide. Back to the cyanide issue. Again, not really what you want in your vaping product. But the real thing comes actually after the THC, contaminated THC is added, because now you've got a nice pen, but you could sell more of them if you diluted your THC more. So there's different cutting agents that people use, and a lot of the cutting agents, they're really thin. So THC oil, very thick, very viscous. So if it's looking thin, you know someone's cut it with something, so you're not gonna buy that. So they found an alternative. It's this, vitamin E acetate. By the drugstore, it's great on your skin. It leaves a nice, shiny coat. It gives you good coating. Not great to breathe in. It coats your lungs. It doesn't let the surfactant get out. It doesn't really let anything get out. It causes a big inflammatory reaction. Kind of, uh, you know, the descriptions of what this disease is, it's kind of halfway between lipoid pneumonia, a bit of bronchiolitis obliterans. So just horrendous pictures of lungs being seen. Now, we haven't seen much of this in Canada. There are three cases uh, that are being investigated right now. But most of this seems to be in America, and really it's not related to the THC. It's not related to jewels. And we're seeing, unfortunately now, a lot of states in America are banning flavored additives for vapes as a result of this crisis, which is a bit unfortunate because those flavored vapes, while they're the bane of, uh, of every uh, parent of every teen around, um, they are very helpful for smokers to stop smoking. So while you're doing this, you may end up killing more people from smoking-related injuries. So it's, it's, uh, we really need to get on top of the, the regulation to be able to wipe this out and probably deal a bit with the cost, because part of the reason this is happening is if you get a legal uh, cartridge, it's gonna cost you 60 bucks. If you buy an illegal one, it's 10 to 15. So uh, you know, money is, is a, uh, not an option for everybody. All right, I've got a few minutes left, and I'm gonna tie it up with some cannabis myths. Uh, so first off, cannabis myth. There has never been a case of fentanyl contaminated cannabis. You'll see this in the paper every now and then. Uh, it is actually physically impossible to smoke fentanyl from a joint. You need to put on a foil or something to actually uh, get it in you. If you smoke in a joint, you're just wasting time. Drug dealers don't do that. You're never gonna find fentanyl in cannabis. Unfortunately, we see this kind of propagated over and over again. Um, there's a study two years ago looking at increased accidents around 420. 420 is the cannabis holiday. Um, April 20th uh, relates to when high school students used to go out after school and smoke pot. Um, 
Subsequent reanalysis of that data showed that uh, it was exaggerated. There were no actual increases in fatal accidents on 420, uh, but there were on Labor Day and around Thanksgiving, which is more to be expected. Um, vaping, I wasn't going to even include this because uh, I thought, well, no one really believes this and it's, it's not really a thing, but uh, vaping in popcorn lung just doesn't happen. Uh, there's an ingredient called diacetyl uh, that used to be found in microwave uh, popping corn. And people who worked in those factories would get a lung condition called popcorn lung. Um, it's never been proven in uh, vaping. And there's actually an a expert in Australia who's offering a significant reward for anybody discovering the first case of popcorn lung from vaping. So uh, if you ever do. But I was at this never happened, has never happened. But that was uh, September 15th, the day before I had to hand in my talk. Uh, the headline in the, in the province. So it's still out there, uh, lots of myths. Um, indica sativa. So if you go to that store over there, they'll, tell you, they'll talk to you about indica and sativa. And for those who have trouble remembering, indica is the one that will put you in the couch. Okay. Um, so these are botanical terms, and they relate to different strains of cannabis. And the original strain that was used mostly in North America was sativa, it came up from Mexico, Grew great, very high levels of THC, um, uh, but only did well in warm climates. It's kind of a problem. If people wanted to grow it elsewhere, they, up, even up in the hills, it wouldn't grow well. So a bunch of growers flew to Afghanistan, and they picked up all these indica seeds. They sewed them into their clothing to bring them back to the States. And they started hybridizing all these sativa plants with indica, bringing a whole new plant, plants that would now thrive in cold weather and could be brought up to British Columbia. And this was the beginning of BC Bud. Um, but since that time, in the 70s, these plants have been relentlessly hybridized. You can no longer tell anything about the effect they're going to have, about the chemical content, by those names. Those names are virtually meaningless. We've got experts uh, saying you know, that any kind of uh, looking at physiological effects differing from these two labels is an exercise in futility. We've got uh, articles in Global BC saying, you know, this is total nonsense. So as much as I can tell from the science, this is not science. This is just, it might as well be phrenology. But I've got some work to do. So this is from the BCMJ, I think in February this year, is an article about cannabis in adolescence. And this is a, a graphic from it. Um, so it says over 99% of cannabis is derived from only two species with radically different chemical compositions and medicinal properties. That's absolutely false. Uh, the primary chemical indi index that separates the strains is THC and cannabidiol ratio. Absolutely false. Uh, there's been a recent study looking at strains gathered from Washington, BC, uh, showing that they are, in fact, identical in terms of C THC and CBD content. Um, sativa strains are higher in THC. Not true. Sativa is chosen for its psychostimulant properties. That is the only true statement in this graphic because it's what people are choosing. I can't say that's not true. They are choosing it for that. They're choosing it wrongly, but that's why they're choosing it. Um, it lifts move and improves cognitive and executive function. Completely unproven. Uh, C indica strains have less THC, allowing the CBD dominant. Not true at all. Uh, it has primarily said it improves sleep, relaxes muscles, relieves pain, and assuages anxiety. If I put this on my documents, the college would be after me in a heartbeat because none of this can be proven. Okay. But this appeared in our peer-reviewed journal. So I'm going to say there's a need for ongoing education here, um, not only for the public, but for also for physicians. So I'm just tying it up in my last couple minutes here. Uh, overall, um, in this past year, we've seen kind of more meh than can again. Really hasn't been a disaster so far. And I'm completely accepted that we're early in the process. Um, we're finding that roadside breathalyzers are a poor way to test for cannabis impairment. A lot of police departments just haven't got them. They aren't using them because of all these problems. And I, see, I sense we'll see those uh, going out. There are, incidentally, there are apps you can get on your phone that uh, you, know, you hang in one leg and balance, and that'll tell you if you're impaired or not. Kind of interesting kind of thing. But overall, the cannabis impairment is relatively mild uh, in driving. Um, you may want to consider a prepotent for CHS. But kind of my big message from a lot of this is that the morbidity and mortality that we have been seeing, that we're seeing now, is predominantly related to a lack of regulation 
from unregulated products. And the sooner that we can change that, the sooner that we can make all these products available, accessible, and safe, the less work I think we're all going to have to do with that as far as the clinical stuff. But I feel like my job is only just beginning as far as education, so I'm going to keep on doing it. But thank you for all and coming and listening to me.